Um, okay, so for those playing along at home, uh, we are about to do an interview with uh, Lauren Turton. And so she is from a podcast called Freedom with NFTs. And she, uh, she, in addition to that, she's a business coach and she's a podcaster and she runs a restaurant called uh, Chow Chow Piadina. <laughs> Uh, she uh, runs an organization called SheQuest, uh, uh, Lisa's NFTs. And so, yeah, we're really excited to have her on. We might crack into it. Uh, I don't know. Isaac, do you want to, do you have anything you want to start with? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, all right. So, um, so one thing that I actually, um, I noticed, so, so we listened to, we listened to a bunch of, uh, of different episodes from your podcast and, uh, we really noticed that there's a whole lot of, um, of episodes where you're you're kind of in all of these different projects like you um you're across like so many different things so um so one of the ones that really stood out to me was Chia Chia Piadina which um which was quite cool um a little uh, a little restaurant uh you know uh, NFT loyalty program restaurant so that was um that was really cool uh you've got you've got a personal NFT collection um you've written a book uh and there's a whole bunch of different charitable organizations um there so that was really cool as well as as well as a business course if i'm uh, if i'm not wrong there is that um is that right i used yeah. to be a business coach before i got into the web3 space and with business coaching it was an incredible journey that i was on pre covid i had a program called the wealthy wellness system where i would help clients create launch an offer and scale their businesses using paid ads. And then when COVID hit, I had to shut that business down and took a few months off. During that time, I reflected on what I loved most about that previous program I had. And I created a new program called Soul Career Clarity. And instead of just launching the program and signing clients right away, I decided to put it in book format and then use that as the marketing material to launch that program. So that's the number one best-selling book that you mentioned, Soul Career Clarity. And I had a wonderful coaching business, amazing clients. I've been featured in Forbes for the work that I've done. And interestingly enough, I find out about NFTs. And I went deep down the rabbit hole last summer, the months of June and July. And it was really interesting because during that time, I realized I wanted to go all in on the Web3 space. And that article in Forbes had just came out. And I was like, oh my God, identity crisis is happening right now. This is really bizarre. And so it was this really interesting time in my career where I really had to make the choice of, do you stay with the business that you're now known for and scale that? Or do you shut it all down and start over again? And instinct told me to shut it down, start all over again, because I knew that where we are in history with Web3 and NFT technology, that if I were to go all in now, that I would be at the forefront of what was happening. Yeah, wow. That's that's pretty amazing. And that's a bold move. And so uh, props to you for doing that. Can I ask more specifically? So Isaac mentioned um, Chow Chow Piadina, which is a restaurant in San Diego, right? Italian restaurant. Sounds phenomenal. We'll have to visit. I looked at some photos and it's beautiful. So aesthetic. Uh, and so you've done a great job. Can I ask, could you could you maybe share your little experiences there with, uh, as Isaac said, you were doing an NFT loyalty platform. I think I even heard on one of your podcasts, it's interesting hearing you reflect on the fact that you thought, actually, maybe it was a little bit too early in regards to the timing of it because... Um, it was such a um, like it was such a new technology for people who were coming into the store who just wanted to get some pasta or whatever it is that you're selling. And so it would be interesting to hear your reflections on that and and how that played out. Absolutely. So Chow Chow Piadina is a restaurant that I'm co-owner of. It's in San Diego, California, in the neighborhood La Jolla. And I appreciate your compliments on the aesthetic of the restaurant. Um, one of the business partners and I we designed everything. And so again, I really appreciate that. We were supposed to open before the pandemic hit. The pandemic hit. We weren't able to open for an entire year. We paid rent the entire time. We got no government assistance. So you can imagine the hardships that we went through to get our doors open. And it was during this time that I found out about NFTs. 
And I kept thinking to myself, it's absolutely incredible what you can do with NFTs in regards to generating sales on the blockchain digitally, and also how you can leverage NFTs in regards to utility or unlockable content to provide value for your community. But I needed people in the door of my restaurant. It is a restaurant. You need people in the door of the restaurant, right? That's the whole point. And so I kept thinking to myself, how can I create something using NFTs that gets people into the doors? And I had seen Gary Vaynerchuk speak in San Diego at a real estate conference. And it was the day of the Christie's auction. He's speaking at a real estate conference for hundreds upon hundreds of people. And when he brought up NFTs, the day of the, you know, it's Christie's auction, only a handful of people responded. And I was like, whoa, this is interesting right now. There's only a handful of people that responded to this. Wow. We all found each other in the lobby and we were vibing afterwards talking. And I said to one of the people there, I was like, I've got to figure something out for my restaurant. We need to generate in real life sales. And I was an active member of the San Diego NFT Friends Discord community, which was founded by an incredible woman in the space. Her name is Valerie V. Dizzle 777 on Twitter. And I knew that she had so much more knowledge and experience than I did, especially in regards to the tech side of things. That's not my area of expertise. So I got in contact with her and I said, Valerie, please help me. This is my end goal. I want to create a customer loyalty program using NFTs. And my goal is to get this out before NFT NYC, which is only a few weeks away. And so we busted butt the next weeks to create a customer loyalty program that uses POOPs and NFTs. And if you're not familiar with what a POOP is, it stands for Proof of Attendance Protocol. It's a free NFT to create and it's a free NFT to obtain. And so we're all familiar with the coffee shop, hole punch card. Every time you go to the coffee shop, you spend over $10, you get the 10th hole punch, your 10th coffee is free. We essentially did that, but using POOPs and NFTs. And with this customer loyalty program that we created, we debuted it to the San Diego NFT Friends community, which is an established NFT community in San Diego. So we treated this as our beta testers to see what would work, what would not work. And some of the things that we found is that we created a program that was essentially too big in regards to the length of the program. So we created five tiers. Every time you come in and spend over $20, you get a POOP. Every six time you come in, you get an NFT that includes utility, like a free appetizer on your next visit. The program is lengthy to go through in order to get to the end of it. So that was a learning lesson that we experienced with that. The other thing is that we only launched this program to about 30 people because we wanted to launch it to people who knew about NFTs because it's a restaurant. We can't have our team members there focused on food sales and wine sales, or no, we need them focused on food sales and wine sales. We can't have them explaining how to create a crypto wallet, what an NFT is. It would take away from customer service. And so what we're doing now with this program is we're really going to scale it back and we're going to move forward with just using POOPs because you can get a POOP with an email address. And so our end goal is to be able to use blockchain technology to generate in real life sales, but also being realistic about the fact that we're so early in the space and that we do need to honor what is happening in regards to the business currently, it being a restaurant and the focus being food and wine sales and making the system in a way that's easy for the end user and for the team members that are on site. Long-term goal with what we created is to create a software so that we have the proper systems in place for restaurants to be able to use blockchain technology to generate in real life sales with customer loyalty programs. That's amazing. Wow. And one thing that I was actually going to ask about was the the way that you actually get people to sign up. Because one thing that like if you tried to do this 10 years ago, for example, it's like Oh, what what is a Bitcoin? How do I how do I sign up for a wallet? How do I sign up for an exchange? Um, you know, they have to do this whole lengthy process just to get the underlying cryptocurrency. And you guys are like, oh, coming in here with a POAP, you said. Um, 
and uh, and you just come in there with an easy email address, and it's um it's all sorted. So that's really cool. Um, speaking of that, um, Chow Chow Piadina a little more. So I um, I listened to one of your episodes, and well, a few of them uh, were uh, where people were making um, people were making NFTs which had meaning, but they didn't particularly have utility. So like, for example, uh, Happy Land Gummy Bears, um, which is a really meaningful cause. Uh, and it was giving back to charity and it was about mental health awareness and um, and a difficult time that the creators had. And um, and that was really good. It's really good to obviously um, do those sorts of projects. Uh, but I think it's also really cool to actually say, hey, let's actually use this for someone because a lot of people, a lot of people that uh, come into the NFT space or whatever, they're like, Oh, it's a it's a picture of a monkey. Like, what what is this? You know, and so uh, so one thing that I wanted to ask you is how important is it to have something meaningful um, versus how important is it to have something with great utility, like like what you're building here? It depends on the audience that you're creating your NFT project for. So something I'm really passionate about is doing market research and actually identifying what your community values and creating what it is that they value. I see so many people coming into the NFT space and creating projects that have utility that they think is valuable without actually doing the market research and asking the question, what is it that you would find valuable? And some things that people might find valuable is a 30 minute consultation with the founder of the project access to them in the DMS Monday through Friday during business hours, a weekend retreat with the founder of an NFT project. It can come in the form of a signed copy of your book. If you have courses or programs that you've created, there's so many ways that you can use NFTs and have utility with them that are valuable. But you first need to find out what it is that your community actually finds to be valuable before actually creating the NFT project. So again, market research Get in there, ask the questions, have conversations, do polls, get on calls with people. Even something as silly as a poll that I did today on my Twitter was, what color do you think I should dye my hair for VCon? And people are voting on it. And you know what? I'm going to go with the color that people say for what I should dye my hair for VCon. I asked it for a reason. I wanted to know what my community thought would be cool. And so now I'm going to create content around this entire poll so that I can give back to my community because they voted on it and they cared. This is just a small example of what you can do in regards to market research and how you can really connect with people in regards to content creation and how you show up in the world. Yeah, wow. That's pretty amazing. Uh, this, this seems to be like a, a reoccurring theme, which is so evident throughout uh, the NFT space, which is just the community aspect of it. It's it's not something that I've ever seen in a technology before. Like we've seen a lot of iterations of different technologies and there's always been like a niche crowd behind them, obviously. But I guess even like the nature of the community seems really positive. I don't know if you could speak a little bit more towards what you've experienced in the community. You've obviously mentioned uh, the community that you have there in relation to our San Diego friends, right? And so um, like how important, let's say maybe I'm, I'm someone who wants to be a part of the space. I'm you back in early uh, 2021 and I like the idea of it. Maybe I'm not technical because like I never thought that this was going to be a thing. So like how, how do I get, how do I become a part of it and how can I contribute in a valuable way to the ecosystem that is NFTs? Great question. So I remember back in June and July of last year, I hadn't connected with the community yet. And some of those days were pretty dark because I was spending so much time reading about a topic that was so overwhelming to me. And I didn't have anyone to talk to. I didn't have anywhere to go. Fortunately, I did find a few people early on that were available to support me during my journey, but I wasn't close with them yet. So I think it's very important for people who are new to the NFT space to find someone that they vibe with, that they like, whether it be through their content on TikTok, on Twitter, in Discord, and just get all up in what that person is doing. Participate in their community. Let's say they host Twitter spaces every Tuesday and Thursday at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. That's what I do. Show up every Tuesday and Thursday. Ask me questions, get up in my DMs, 
Lauren, how can I be a part of what you're doing? How can I support? And if it's not me that you align with, that's fine, but find somebody else that you align with and get all up in there and become a part of their community. I've had people volunteer to be community managers for the Freedom with NFTs Discord. And that volunteer position ended up landing him a job elsewhere. And so just getting involved and putting yourself out there is going to be a way that you can really tap into some people that really want to help see you be successful in the space. And I think it's very important for women who are entering the space to find other women that they vibe and connect with. This is still a very male dominated industry. I believe it's 85% men. So finding women that you connect with, a great example that you can do in order to find that community is go on TikTok, find a content creator that you think is cool, and then start to look at who they're following Look at the comments that they're commenting back to. Those are people that they're vibing with and start to see the trend of who's hanging out together and ask them, hey, how can I get involved with what you guys are doing? Do you have a group chat? Do you have a discord? How can I be a part of this community and just put yourself in there? Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, that's that's definitely a really cool um, thing to say because we would. I'm going to ask about the. Um, I was going to ask about community building and um, and all that, but you covered it off really well. Um, so uh, so if I pivot a little, you were saying that when you're choosing um, projects, you like to invest in the art you love. Um, now I have a, a bit of a counterpoint to that. With uh, for example, all right. So this is this is more cryptocurrency general related, but. Uh, one of the projects I really liked and have really been following for a while has been Luna and um, and UST, which um, which has taken a massive um, dive, unfortunately. But uh, you know that's all that's all part of it. Um, have you ever been sort of sucked in too far into a specific project, and um, and you had to kind of readjust your process for picking NFTs? Have you ever had to like think about? Oh, okay. What's um? What am I doing here? Like, have you questioned the whole the whole process of of NFTs doing that? So, first of all, I don't play with money that I can't afford to lose, which I think is a good takeaway for anyone who's listening to this episode that's new to the space. If you can't put that money in confidently, knowing that if it goes away. You're, you know, something like, no, you can't do that. So just really having boundaries with yourself and saying, I'm only going to invest money that I can afford to lose. And then in regards to the NFT projects that I've invested in, I've invested in Fame Lady Squad. I've invested in Boss Beauties. I hold a Happy Land Gummy Bear, which was gifted to me from them. And the reason why I chose Fame Lady Squad and Boss Beauties is because Fame Lady Squad, that story is historic, it's iconic, and I wanted to be a part of that community. Same with Boss Beauties. I saw that the founders were incredible women, and I saw how focused they were on supporting women in the space. And I said, I need to be a part of that community. That's something that I need to tap into. And so that's why I decided to make those investments. And if you look at my NFT wallet, you'll also see that I hold um, work from Akomi. He is a Canadian artist that's based here in Cabo San Lucas, Mexico. And the reason why I invested in his work is because I met him in person and he had told me that he was going to introduce me to certain people. And he did. He came through with what he said he was going to do. And I said, yeah, I want to I want to support his project. And that's something for me that's really important is um, supporting people, supporting people and the artwork that they create, knowing that I have a relationship with them. If you look at my wallet, you'll see that I don't hold anything of super high value. I don't hold a board ape. I don't hold a friends one yet. And the, one of the reasons why for all of that too is because of the time frame that I came into the space. And so again, I'm all about investing in people that I want to have relationships with or communities that I say, yes, I want to be a part of that. Wow, that's really cool. Again, it, it epitomizes the community aspect of the space. It's, um, it's actually really cool. So I guess along those lines, it'd be interesting to hear a bit more about your own experiences as a creator. So my understanding is uh, you were doing some photography stuff and it was interesting to you 
and right and then and and then and so uh, you're like oh this could be something that could be sold as an nft right and so in my mind that would relate to so many people potentially watching this right now who are artists in some form could be talking musicians here but we could be talking painters we could be talking digital artists um could you talk through a little bit of your experiences that might inspire them as to what they could possibly do this is one of my favorite parts about the nft space and what this technology has done for artists aside from myself I can think of so many other artists that have been doing projects for over a decade that never came to the fruition that they wanted it to come to because of not being in front of the right market, not being connected with the right community. The list goes on and on. And what NFTs have allowed them to do is get in front of the right community, be able to offer their work and utility in such a unique way. And for me, it's similar to that. I've been taking photos of myself in a rabbit mask for over a decade. The project is called Find the Hair, H-A-R-E. And I started this project when I was in a community college, night program, winter semester in the suburbs of Dayton, Ohio. And if you're familiar with the Midwest of America, you know how miserable winters are. So imagine, I'm about 24 years old, I've dropped out of college five, six times at this point, and I decide that I am going to go to school for something. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to get a certificate. I can do that in like a year, year and a half. It's not an associate's. It's not a bachelor's. I can commit to this. And I thought to myself, well, what is it that you're actually going to do for a certificate program? So then I immediately looked, immediately looked and identified that there were night school options. And I was like, great, night school. I'm not a morning person, never have, never will be. And so then I was looking at the night school programs and I was like, oh, there's a photography program. I've always done photography. I'm going to do that. So I'm going through this photography program and I'm actually not doing that great. And my professor, he calls me out and he's like, Lauren, you're actually not doing that great in this program. I'm going to show you a form of photography that I think you're going to like. I was like, okay, Professor Dersh, show me. And he takes the time to explain self-portrait photography to me. He shows me incredible self-portrait female artists, and he explains to me how they created the end result. And he asked me, do you resonate with this? Do you want to try this? And I said, yes, I want to try it. So I had access to an abandoned warehouse that my buddy was throwing rapes at. And I asked him if I could go into the warehouse. He's like, yeah, of course, Lauren. So I go to the warehouse, I set up my tripod, I set up the camera and I take pictures of myself. And imagine winter, Dayton, Ohio, like 30, 40 degrees Fahrenheit. It's snowing, it's nasty out. I'm in an abandoned warehouse. It's super creepy. And I start taking photos of myself. I get back to my place and I start looking at the photos and I realize I look very animal-like because it's super dark, it's super dingy, I'm really blurry in the photos. But I wasn't animal-like enough. So I decided to take it a step further and go to the Halloween store and get a Halloween mask. And I remember looking at all of the masks and the one that stood out to me the most was the one with the rabbit ears because the rabbit ears stood out more. And I thought to myself, that's going to look really good in low lighting. So I went back to the warehouse. I took a series of photos of myself in this rabbit mask. This was when we were using, um, we were using dark room. We were using film photography and we were using digital. So I was doing like a combination of both. And I presented the final product. There are about 10 images in this series. And my professor was like, that's it. You did it. Keep doing this. People are going to think you're crazy, but keep doing this. And sure enough, people thought I was crazy for many, many years for doing this project. Soon after, I ended up moving to San Diego, California, and I had the opportunity to show my work in art shows, art galleries. And soon I started putting on my own shows at all of the nightclubs in San Diego. I started an event company called Lucky, and I hosted pop-up shops. And I was crushing it with these art shows. I had my work that I was selling. I had clothing line that I was selling. And while these events were absolutely incredible and amazing, I wasn't always selling my work. And it was a really interesting thing to go through where people will come and look at your work and say, I like it so much. This is amazing. This is incredible. But then they don't invest in the artwork. And it can be really disheartening. So imagine I'm going through this for almost a decade. 
And when I found out about NFTs and I saw what NFTs were doing for artists, I said, okay, this could be it. This could be why my professor said, keep doing this, keep trying. And so what I've done with Find the Hair in regards to NFTs is I've created two collections. One is called the Spring Hair and the other is called Find the Hair. And the Find the Hair series is from that original project, my Genesis project, and it's priced at a higher price point. And that project is specifically targeted for collectors, art collectors in the NFT space. And then the Spring Hair collection is at a lower price point, and that is specifically for community members that want to support me and my journey. And it's been really incredible because I have connected with one collector in particular, and I went through such an amazing experience in regards to meeting him, opening up the door in regards to the conversation leading to the fact that he was a collector and then me having to navigate, okay, well, how do I ask if I can show him my work? I was so nervous. Eventually I did get the courage to ask him to show my work. And he looked at it and he was like, I, I love it. I absolutely love it. He's like, I can't explain it. I, there's a feeling in my stomach. And that for me means that I love this artwork. And he promised me that he would end up investing in one of the pieces. And he did about a week later. And what's been so incredible about that is that we now have a friendship We've gotten on a few calls with each other. We text each other and we're going to link up in person at one of the next IRL events. And that for me has been such an incredible experience to go through this journey as an artist for over a decade, which I know so many artists can relate to their work falling upon people who don't resonate with it to then being able to link with people who really appreciate art and appreciate you. It's an incredible journey to go on. Yeah, definitely. It's um, there's a lot of communities out there with um, with a lot of those NFT projects. Um, one thing that I really wanted to ask you about was uh, it was a really cool little project that you've been doing, which we haven't even haven't even mentioned yet. Um, I think it was it was uh, Layla's or Leela's or something, uh, and it was kind of like a little a little consulting company which consults with hospitality and hotel industries to create NFT projects on their own. So essentially. Um, I say a copy paste of what Chow Chow Piadina is doing or something like that, uh, where you can kind of specialize, specialize something a bit around a client. Uh, what, what kind of industries are you working with there and what have been the biggest challenges in getting them to build like their own communities? So the project is called Leales. And the reason why we chose that name is because Leales translate to, translates to loyal in Spanish. And I'm actually located now in Cabo San Lucas, Mexico. So it makes sense why we would choose a word in Spanish. And something that we identified here in Cabo is that with all of the resorts and hotels, luxury, very luxury establishments, that they had no idea what was happening in regards to NFTs, blockchain, et cetera. And we started approaching different opportunities here and saying, hey, we'd love to get you on the blockchain. We'd love to create a customer loyalty program. Here's something that we've done in the past that we can you know, model off of and use as a case study. And we are working with our first clients, which is really exciting. Um, I'm not at the point where I can say who our clients are, but we have projects that we'll be releasing with them in the summer of this year. And it's really interesting because we're making sure that we navigate things in the right way. So one of the things that we all need to remember when launching an NFT project is it doesn't matter if you already have an established community. It doesn't matter if you have them because they probably don't know what NFTs are. So don't think because you have an established community of 20,000 people right now that if you drop an NFT project to them, they're going to invest in it. Most likely they're not going to. So we're really making sure that we look at these different venues and we're doing surveys, we're doing market research so we can understand what percentage of their customers actually know about crypto, blockchain, NFTs, who has actually purchased an NFT already in their database. This is all the stuff that we're starting with so that we have the proper data so that we can do the proper marketing for their current communities. And we're also going to be building their own communities from the NFT and Web3 space. So we're going to have two communities that we merge together and we launch these projects too. Wow, that's crazy. I think 
is there anything that, and I guess to be honest, we're wrapping up here, but I guess if there's anything I'm taking away from this conversation, it's the versatility of use cases that are available um, for NFT technology, right? And so I guess one that I think really brings it home so nicely um, is, so you're involved in a philanthropic uh, a thing called Help the, the Carney, right? And so you talk a little bit about that. I believe you're maybe the, the, the president or the vice president. You can clarify that in a second. Um, and so... I, I think at one point in one of the one of the podcasts I was listening to, you mentioned that you'd love the future uh, to to involve NFTs in, in that space as well. I don't know if you've really thought out what that could look like, but I guess maybe uh, the question could be, could you talk a little bit about that? And could you maybe give us some ideas as to how you'd use NFTs and just generally what the future of NFTs could look like uh, just generally in different industries? I'm so glad you asked this question because I did an incredible interview a few days ago with Josh Hirsch, who is at Susan G. Komen, and he really shared the strategies that they've had to go through with a large nonprofit in order to get them um, accepting cryptocurrency as donations. And the way that they've been able to do this is through a wonderful organization called The Giving Block. And so for nonprofits, what I see from having conversations with other people in the space and then also volunteering as vice president for a very small nonprofit, U.S.-based nonprofit, Help the Kani. We support women and children in southern India. We have several programs and schools that we fund there. The first step that I see for nonprofits is being able to accept cryptocurrency as a form of donations. That's step number one. So for a nonprofit to take this on by themselves is a lot of work. So finding a third party like the Giving Block or another organization that specializes in this is very important. So that's one of the steps that I want to take with Help the Connie is first allowing us to be able to accept crypto as donations. And then like we shared earlier, there's so many different ways that you can leverage NFTs. So eventually it'd be amazing if Help the Connie could launch their own NFT collection and other nonprofits, the same thing. But again, first step is being able to accept crypto as a donation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, no, that's, that's definitely something which can change the world in terms of how people are giving and how people are donating and all that so it's um it's it would definitely make a huge change i think um we are going to start wrapping up now but how can people find out more what's the main thing that you kind of want to people to to find you on you know how um yeah talk about that so before i say that the one thing i want everyone to take away from this is truly to understand where we are in history in regards to web3 and nfts we're at the early adopter phase. We are at the pioneer phase. This will be mainstream one day. Everyone will have a crypto wallet one day. Almost every business will use NFTs one day, just like almost every business uses social media. So if you can get informed and get involved now, you're at the forefront of this. So if anything from this episode, take that away, get informed and get involved. And you can connect with me on Twitter. My handle is at Lauren Turton underscore. L-A-U-R-E-N-T-U-R-T-O-N underscore. Incredible. And it's even right behind you, which is so convenient, right? <laughs> um, thank you so much. So, thank you so much. We've got to do that too, by the way. I was like, put in the notes. <laughs> we'll, we'll work on that. Yeah. yeah. No, we won't have your background though. We'll have ours. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, thank you so much um, for your time. Honestly, this has been so insightful. And being only like 30 minutes feels so short. It felt like we talked for about five minutes. Um, but there was so much in that. I think people take a lot away from it as a business owner, as a creator, as just a normal person coming into the space. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks so much, Lauren.